The first flight of NASA and Lockheed Martin's X-59 is more than a box ticked on a test card, it is a carefully staged entry into a policy debate that has simmered since overland supersonic travel was curtailed in the early 1970s. The experimental jet lifted from Palmdale's Air Force Plant 42 and recovered at NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in Edwards, validating the basics any novel X-plane must prove first, it flies as predicted, its data systems are alive, and its pilots and engineers can begin methodically pushing further. That seemingly modest outcome carries outsized significance because the X-59 is not aimed at speed records or route maps, it is designed to produce evidence, the one currency regulators and communities absolutely require before reconsidering a 50-year prohibition. At the heart of the project lies an idea both simple and radical, if you can reshape the shock waves generated at supersonic speed so that they diffuse into a softer, thump, rather than a sharp, window-rattling crack, then the primary reason for the overland ban begins to erode. The airframe's geometry is a manifesto in metal and composites. A long, needle-like nose and a displaced cockpit push volume forward, redistributing pressure changes along the fuselage so that the acoustic footprint stretches out and weakens by the time it reaches the ground. This is not an attempt to erase physics, it is an attempt to choreograph it. The first flight doesn't prove the thump premise, but it opens the door to the only experiments that can. NASA's Quest mission, of which the X-59 is the signature asset, is structured to generate a dataset that aviation regulators have never been able to collect at scale. The method is straightforward and ambitious, measure the aircraft's acoustic signature precisely at altitude, then fly controlled tracks over pre-selected towns, gather public reactions, and align those subjective impressions with instrumented noise contours. Such, community response, trials transform the problem from an abstract argument about decibels into a question with empirical answers, what do people actually hear, and do they tolerate it during routine life? If the thump is judged unobtrusive, the case for new standards, focused on ground-level effects rather than Mach number alone, becomes materially stronger. It is important to recognize what this milestone is not. It is not a prototype of a commercial airliner. It is not a signal that supersonic routes will appear on booking sites next summer. Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works and NASA have been explicit that the X-59 is a research instrument, a tool built to retire technical and social risk. The first flight therefore matters because it verifies the instrument works. The aircraft's flying qualities were judged adequate, Onboard sensors began collecting the baseline data that will feed models and predictions, and the team can now plan for envelope expansion. The next steps will be deliberate, incrementally higher speeds and altitudes, then the crucial acceleration through Mach 1 where the full acoustic behavior can be observed beyond the wind tunnel and computational fluid dynamics. The legacy of the 1973 ban looms over all of this. That rule was a blunt instrument justified by the blunt reality of sonic booms passing repeatedly over communities unaccustomed to them. Concord operated transoceanic routes where the issue was less sensitive, overland ambitions withered. Since then, two things have changed. First, computational power and design tools now allow engineers to predict and shape shock wave coalescence with a precision that was science fiction half a century ago. Second, the aviation ecosystem has grown more comfortable with performance-based regulation, setting a desired outcome and letting industry meet it, rather than prescribing singular methods. The X-59 is a test of both advances, can design tame the burst of pressure, and can regulators pivot to standards that reflect what people actually experience. There will be headwinds. Atmospheric variability, humidity, temperature gradients, wind shear, can reshape the neat acoustic signature sketched in simulation. What sounds like a muffled thud on a clear, cool morning might propagate differently on a humid afternoon over uneven terrain. Tracing that variability is part of the mission's value, because future rules will have to accommodate real-world conditions, not lab-grade simplicity. Then there is the human factor, noise tolerance is contextual. 
Communities near airports, military ranges, or industrial zones may calibrate, acceptable, differently from quiet suburbs or historic districts. That is precisely why Quest emphasizes flying over diverse locations and linking high-fidelity measurements to surveys rather than assuming a one-size-fits-all reaction. Even if Quest succeeds, a second set of challenges awaits industry. Low boom shaping typically favors long, slender geometries that complicate cabin layout, structural efficiency, and airport compatibility. Engines must balance performance, emissions, and noise across subsonic and supersonic regimes. Economic viability hinges on seat mile cost, maintenance burden, and utilization rates that airlines can defend to investors. The X-59 will not solve these design trade-offs, but by clarifying what sound levels are permissible, and when, it can anchor business cases in something firmer than wishful thinking. If regulators define an acoustic threshold rather than a hard prohibition, manufacturers can optimize toward a measurable target. The geopolitical and market implications are equally noteworthy. If the United States leads in establishing credible quiet supersonic standards, it shapes the global baseline for certification and operations, much as it did with Stage 3 and Stage 4 subsonic noise rules decades ago. That could, in turn, direct investment toward firms already accumulating experience in low-boom aerodynamics, specialized materials, and high-speed systems integration. Conversely, if the data show that even a thump is too disruptive, or too variable to regulate fairly, the findings will still be decisive by preventing a misallocation of capital. Either outcome refines the frontier, which is the fundamental purpose of flight research. There is also a subtler cultural dimension. Supersonic travel has long been suffused with glamour and controversy in equal measure. The X-59 reframes the narrative from spectacle to stewardship. Its success would not be measured by record books but by neighborhood soundscapes remaining undisturbed as a jet passes overhead at twice the speed of a typical airliner. That inversion, speed existing in service to the ground rather than demanding deference from it, is a conceptual shift with real policy consequences. It suggests a model of aerospace progress that integrates community outcomes at the design stage, not as an afterthought. For now, the program's credibility rests on disciplined execution. Each sortie will feed models, tighten uncertainty bands, and either validate or challenge assumptions about shock wave management. Engineers will scrutinize telemetry to understand how closely the real aircraft adheres to its predicted pressure signatures, and test pilots will map out the handling nuances that matter for repeatable, safe operations. Meanwhile, outreach teams will coordinate with towns selected for overflights, ensuring that consent, transparency, and clear communications accompany each data-gathering effort. The virtue of this approach is that it aligns the physics, the public, and the policy in one iterative loop. Seen in that light, the maiden flight's true importance is procedural as much as technical. It initiates a learning cycle with the potential to open, in carefully bounded fashion, the door that closed in 1973. If the evidence supports it, the result will not be the return of a bygone era but the emergence of a new one, quieter, smarter, and grounded in measurable effects rather than assumptions. And if the evidence argues against change, the clarity will be just as valuable. Either way, the X-59 has shifted the conversation from what supersonic flight was to what, with enough rigor and respect for those on the ground, it might responsibly become.